KC Laboratory. Sponsored by Emprise Bank. It's the KC Laboratory presented by Emprise Bank. Whatever life throws your way, make sure you have a strong defense in place with a high interest savings account. Make your family's playbook look just like the Chiefs with blocking, tackling, and a whole lot of winning. Emprise Bank, member FDIC, our partners in Possible. They've been the best. It's been so great working with them. Make sure you're checking them out if you're in the KC area. Trust me, you will not regret doing business with Emprise. I promise you. And I have never once regretted doing business with my dear pals. First, find them on Twitter at Chief in Carolina. Maddie Lane, you watched like a whole day worth of Bills tape earlier in this week. I am so excited to be talking to you about this game today. I am very excited to talk about this game, not only because I have a voice again, but I have to. I, we we have to go off off the rails immediately. What business? What business are we are we conducting? <laughs> Craig, Craig, Craig Stout is here with us. Craig, can you tell us what business we are conducting that is not being regretted? So Maddie's voice is on the way up. Mine is on the way down. Just so you guys know, <laughs> we're we're interchanging. Next week it'll be Kent. So it's cool. Yeah. We, we got this handled. I. I find it hard to believe that any business involving the three of us has gone that swimmingly for Kent. <laughs> I just don't, I don't believe that for a second. At some point we pissed him off. Like the there, there's no not chance gone in well hell. for me. Like we were sitting here, I'm just catching strays the whole time. This has not been fun. It's been a very unenjoyable 20 minutes leading up to the show. I mean, hey, the draft guides, you know, the draft guide's been an enjoyable experience. So there's sure. that, I guess. You, know, you enjoyed sure. doing the taxes on that, I've heard. So that's true. <laughs> you, you very much enjoy the business conducted yeah, there. That's a good point. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about this game. We're all beside ourselves. I, th For me, this... Man, this, this feels different. This game feels different than anything I felt in a long time. And I think the energy across the board here in this room is palpable because I've been talking to these guys all week. I it just I just before we start, like like is this the most excited like is this the most excited you've been since the Super Bowl? Like what is well, how does this feel for you, Maddie? Well, notoriously, the NFL regular season doesn't matter. And now that you've added a seventh seed to the playoffs, the wild card match for the two seed doesn't matter. So, yeah, this is essentially the first game of the year for the Chiefs. So <laughs> this is the most exciting and most important game the Chiefs have played since the Super Bowl, uh, bar none. So, yeah, I'm right there with you, Kit. This is, this is a big one, and it feels a little different than the other 853 weeks of the NFL season. <laughs> yeah, it, it certainly feels like it's been 853. Um yeah, no, this is the biggest game. Uh, and for both franchises, like I, I think you can kind of, it, it's palpable. Th this is the collision course that I think everybody was kind of hoping for in the playoffs if you are a neutral or a casual observer. And it's also the kind of matchup if you want to hold yourself as a fan of one of these teams. It's the true barometer in the AFC. This is the matchup you wanted as well. Like, if the Bills or the Chiefs would have lost before they got to the other one, there was always going to be kind of that thing in the back of their mind. It's like, yeah, yeah, you know, it was what it was. That team won. That team got to where they needed to go. But there was that other team that they didn't get to play. This is the this is the marquee matchup in the AFC. And, and that's not disrespecting the Bengals or the Titans. This is the one. This is the one that everybody wants to see. This is the one that both of these fan bases want to win the most of all all of the AFC matchups. I mean, Kent called it the AFC championship earlier in this week. It feels like it. it's got that kind of mm -hmm. big game vibe to it. And it is a big game. It matters. It's not something that's just going to be a loss, a, you know, a one at the end of the record. This is for everything. So it just matters that much more. So yeah, it, it is palpable. This is the biggest game since that Super Bowl loss that the Chiefs had last year. Well, and There's last year, oh, I got... I got clapped back at a lot because I called the Bills last year the 2018 Chiefs, as in they were clearly a team that was on the rise, that was going up against the team that was clearly the best in the division, you're the boogeyman of the of the conference. And I, a lot of Chiefs fans kind of got upset and like they tried to look for ways that the two teams weren't comparable. But like it looks even more true this year. You have the Bills who arguably have been more impressive in spurts this year than the Chiefs have been. They still have to go and take care of the team. The difference is the 2019 Chiefs 
never had to see the Patriots again. Now, the Patriots were on the downturn. The Patriots were on the mm -hmm. last leg when the Chiefs mm -hmm. lost them in 2018. So we don't know how that ever would have went because the Chiefs are still in their prime of their run right now. The Patriots weren't. But just that Bills team last year was very much felt like 2018 Chiefs. They, as a fan base, as a team, they are trying to take that next step. They are trying to do what the Chiefs did in 2019. They're trying to take that step from good competing up and coming team to a team that can actually win the Super Bowl. They just have to get to the Chiefs who are trying to remain atop like the Patriots did for so long, like the Steelers did earlier in the 2000s as staying at the top of the AFC. So it is a huge matchup for both sides. It's just, it's interesting how close this Bills team and the Chiefs team of just a couple years ago aligned. And I think it's probably, let's put it this way. If the Chiefs go ahead and win this game, and I'm, you know, we're not predicting anything yet, but if the Chiefs go ahead and win this game, it's going to be closer to those Brady Patriots versus the Colts, man, the man and Colts, you know, right. sort of collision courses in the playoffs. Cause now all of a sudden it's, okay, can Josh Allen get past this Chiefs team? So, yeah, winning this means a significant amount for that Buffalo Bills franchise as well to try not to be behind the eight ball because now then all of a sudden, yeah, the Chiefs are that boogeyman for that team. So it's going to be very important for them to come out and win it. So there's just, there's so many narratives or so many storylines. It, it That's what's making this game feel so much bigger than it even is. And it's a big game. Yeah, like the, this is this is a chance for the Bills to define themselves as a team on equal footing as the Chiefs. And this can help set the course of whether or not their big brother uh, is the Chiefs or not, whether there's there's some kind of parody to this, because obviously the Chiefs got bopped in week five. But yeah, <laughs> there's a lot that's changed. I'm fascinated and I'm, I'm sure we'll get here at some point, but I'm just fascinated to see if week five was the exorcism that the Bills thought they needed before they got absolutely stomped by the Chiefs when it mattered, you know, or, you know, they if they let out some frustration too early, if they peaked too early against the Chiefs, like I think we kind of talked a little bit about those narratives a little bit more early in the year, but or in the in the week, but this is this is God, this game's gonna be insane. This game's gonna be nuts. You can feel you can feel it. Social media is something right now. Twitter mm. is mm. just it is spicy. There is a lot of talking and a lot of swagger and a lot of confidence up in the Northeast. And it's going to be a very interesting and potentially delicious weekend here in Kansas City. We got to talk about how that can happen. And we got to talk about this Bills team, a very good team. The Chiefs have always seen them once. Uh, but let's talk about the offensive side of the football. And let's just kind of, we're going to do things a little bit differently. Second time we've watched, you know, we've talked about this team. This is a different game. It's a bigger game. Um, so let's just, we're going to kind of mix some things up. So Maddie, off the top, like, what is this Bills defense? Summarize this B Bills defense in, in your words and your words alone. They're good. I think. <laughs> I think. I think. Yeah. They, no. They've yeah. played exactly two good passing offenses all year, one of which being the Chiefs in week five when nothing was going well. And that was when they gave up the second most passing yards of the year, I believe, was to the Kansas City Chiefs. So, With like, Davius White still available? Third, third most. Yeah. So, it, they didn't play anybody. So like if they finished first in the defense, first in points given up and first, I believe in yards given up. And yet somehow, some way, I have no idea what to think about them because the only time they've played a good passing offense since Thanksgiving was the Tampa Bay Buccaneers who just took them to, took them to town. Like they moved the ball up and down the field when they needed to, they scored at will. But then you look and like every other game, they're shutting teams out. They're playing excellent. It's just against nobody. So the, the Jets twice, the Dolphins. I mean, they played no good passing team. So it's really hard to get a read on what this Bills defense is. And especially when you look at the fact that Tredavious White is now out, that's the best player on their defense is gone. They have a lot of solid players, a lot of guys that can impact the game, but I don't even know if they have an elite. This defense led the league in points allowed and I believe yards allowed, and they don't have a single Pro Bowl player on defense. Not a single one because Tredavious White got hurt. And I can't, I don't even know who you can make a case that should be in there for sure. So I don't know what to think about the defense. They're not bad, but I hesitate to like every every other analyst analyst is giving them this huge advantage on the their defense on that side of the ball. I'm looking at it, I'm like, 
But who did they beat? What did they do that was impressive against the good teams they played? Because they didn't really play many of them. So what are we really relying on to say this defense is good? But at the same time, what am I going to sit here and poke holes in when they dominate all this inferior competition that they play? Yeah, I mean, we talk about all the time. It's like the Chiefs defense, when they were going through that stretch, it was like, well, but who have they played? I mean, you can say the same things about the Buffalo Bills, but they've just done it all year long. They really have. They shot everybody down. I mean, when we... When they were going into that Kansas City Chiefs game, they already had two shutout victories. And it doesn't matter who you're playing. It's hard to shut teams out in the NFL. It's really hard to it do. It really is. It ridiculously hard. And they just kept doing it. They kept coming up big. Now, I will say this, to Maddie's point, man, those safeties are good. Micah Hyde <laughs> and Jordan Poyer are so good at playing off of each other. And then on the second level, Matt Milano, and Tremaine Edwards are so good. Now they're not elite. We're not talking about the the you know upper echelon players, but these two guys, you know, basically those four in the middle of the field at the same level, those two guys work together in a tandem so well. And then those tandems work together to just create this nice, solid middle of the field defense. They're really hard to run on, they're really hard to pass in the middle of the field on. They've just done such a good job of taking away everything. We've gone off, you know, throughout the offseason, throughout lots of things about how Spags and Bill Belichick build up this middle of the field defense and try and funnel the low percentage throws to the outside. That's definitely something that the Buffalo Bills do. And they do it with these really they're they're really, really good players. They're about as good as you can get to elite without actually being elite. These guys make such a big difference. And oh yeah, that defensive line is full of a bunch of guys that are really good too. Again, I agree with Natty. You don't have anybody that you're looking at and you're going, hey, that guy is the guy that you need to make sure that you take away and that you you know, eliminate from the game plan. There's not a singular guy that you can eliminate because they are so good throughout the entire defense and they play so well together. Outside of the cornerbacks, which now about Tredavious White, they are a little weak on the outside. Everywhere else is just that next level up from you know basically the rest of the league, and that's why they've been so good on defense this year. Tredavious White's a pretty big loss, and I mean like duh, <laughs> but like I think you look at like they've they they had a blue chip along that you know in that position group, and then they've just kind of tried to skate by, much similar to the strategic approach that the Chiefs have taken. You know, guys like Levi Wallace aren't exactly world beaters. He's been fine. He's been capable, but Dane Jackson, um, some of these other guys, you know, they're they're not they're not the same kind of caliber players. So like there is some weaknesses there. Um, the athleticism at the linebacker position really sticks out to me as something that um is a little bit different than you know what the Chiefs have seen a lot of. And like there's some teams that have, you know, given them some problems with some athleticism at their linebacker position, uh, namely Tampa Bay the last time that those two teams played although the front is not nearly as good as the front that we saw from Tampa Bay. Who's and is, the dis- though? Who's is, the dis- though? Uh, come the on discrepancy- now. Yeah. <laughs> well, the discrepancy on the offensive line, too. So, yeah, yeah like, this is a fascinating matchup. It's it's going to be interesting to see what this Bills team is really made of defensively because I think they can be got when you look at it on paper. It's just well, a matter of the Chiefs going to be able to do it. I was gonna say, here's the tricky question is like, what does the defense do? Like what, mm-hmm. how does their defense play? Like, what do they do in coverage? So from what I see, especially without Shadavius White, it's been a heavy reliance on a lot of quarter, quarter, half coverage. Like they are protecting those corners as much as possible. So you're going to get a lot one safety is going to play, be playing a deep half over presumably a number one wide receiver, the best vertical threat most of the time. And then the other safety is going to be playing in a quarter coverage on the opposite seam. But what they do is, whether it's Hyde, whether it's Poyer, that guy does such a good job at looking back across the field and cutting crossing routes, cutting anything coming over the middle of the field. And then you have one other corner left over on the other side who's just playing essentially vertically up the boundary. And that's all he's really worried about. So they do do that. It's I think losing Tredavious White has made them a little bit more predictable in their coverage shells. Before losing him, they were pretty much middle of the pack in just about every coverage type you could mm-hmm. run. They played a little bit of everything. Since losing Tredavious White, though, I do think they've had to rely, especially against good offenses, a lot more on some zone coverage stuff. Like I said, I see a lot of quarter, quarter, half, and that's a little different than what they played against the Chiefs the first time. The first time, they played a lot of cover one. 
They played a lot of one rob or a lot of man coverage. I don't know if they can get a one. I think the Chiefs are better against it now than they were then. But I don't know if you can get away with that, with having to protect both sets of outside corners. And then kind of with what Kent said, down the stretch, yeah, they have athletic linebackers. They allowed those guys to play a lot of man coverage or pick up tight ends a lot over the middle of the field down the stretch. And it didn't go great. As athletic as those guys are, they were getting beat pretty frequently by the ghost of Rob Gronkowski. I mean, like it wasn't particularly close. He was breaking them off all the time. So I do think their coverage shells right now are something the Chiefs should be able to take advantage of. And they're slightly more predictable than I think they were early in the year. Add on the fact they're not going to blitz the Chiefs. They have not blitzed the Chiefs the last three times these teams have played. It's been like under five times in three games they've blitzed Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs. They're not going to blitz. They're going to play. You kind of got a good idea of their coverage shells right now. If it's going to be that simple, if it's as simple as what I'm saying right now, which I hope for their sake they change it up, but if it is <laughs> this basic, I mean, it could be a bloodbath because you can't give Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes this much freedom to know you're not going to blitz. When you play man, your guys can't keep up with our guys. And when you're in zone – you're going to have to protect both outside corners by these specific coverages. I know I could see ways that this coverage shell becomes a little bit predictable for the Bills. Yeah, and that's kind of what, you know, what we were talking about earlier with how this defense is shifted from from the first time that they've seen it because it does get predictable. Now, they they're still really good at disguising some elements of it. Don't get me wrong. Like they'll they'll pretend like they're going to cut, you know, like a backside, you know, over or something like that with the deep safety that's supposed to have the half and a quarterback will see, "Oh, I got my number 1 one-on-one -on, -one on the outside and they'll throw it and oh, look, Micah Hyde is bailing and he's able to come up with a pick." Like they're really good at baiting quarterbacks into those sorts of things. But they do get a little bit more predictable. We got to see even Jack Doyle for the Indianapolis Colts tight end there was able to take advantage of those linebackers a little bit. And they're good linebackers in coverage, but they're just being asked to cover so much ground from more athletic players in the middle of the field. And Travis Kelsey is really good at shaking those guys. You know, they're not going to be Levante David. They're not going to be able to man up and take away Travis Kelsey in those scenarios. So if they do choose to do that, it's going to be very difficult for them to guard him. Just like if they drop into a zone and they're playing some of these match coverages to try and pick the stuff up, you see on tape a lot of times against the Bills, these light drags, these high lows, these flood concepts that are really stressing some of these zone match coverages and things like that. That's where teams have had the most success, especially with these young, inexperienced cornerbacks. Those guys, their, their spacing's not great. And so you see a lot of stuff that comes open late, that comes open regularly. And when you don't have a blitz on and you're not forcing the quarterback to speed up his rhythm, to speed everything up, and your four-man rush is not able to get home against a guy that can move around the pocket a little bit, now all of a sudden those flood concepts just get wide open you're able to hit at all three levels of the defense. So you're going to force them into some deeper safety looks. You're going to force them into more of those two high looks pre-snap. That's when the Chiefs have really taken advantage of the run game. That's when they've taken advantage of the intermediate and shorts. There's all sorts of ways that you can attack this. But if they get that predictable and the Chiefs have the time because they're not blitzing, now, all of a sudden, that just opens everything up a little bit more for Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes, who are going to be on an A-game script in a playoff game. I think it's interesting, though. I think they probably broke some of their tendencies and were a little bit less predictable the last time that these two teams played, which is, I think mm -hmm. is something interesting. Is I do think, and obviously, you're kind of talking about they've become a little bit more predictable now, but I think even, you know, I think the the Bills had a pretty good idea and probably broke a few tendencies to try to go out and win that game thinking, hey, you know, like there's obviously the mentality of, hey, the AFC or the division runs through, you know, you got to win your division first. You got to, you know, then you get to take care of business second. I could have seen them saying, hey, you know what? We got to win our division too, but yeah, we still got to make it through this team. So they, I think they probably mixed some things up the last two, last time these two teams played because it looked early on with some of the game call, some of the game script that the Chiefs were anticipating you know, some softer coverage at times on the edges and trying to hit some outs and some quick outs and they weren't able to get to them and they were a little bit better covered. I think, you know, they were anticipating some different coverages. The screen game really didn't hit very well. So I think they might have broken some tendencies the last time that these two teams lined up. Fascinating to see if they're able to mix up 
enough or or if they're going to be as like, as predictable as we're talking about because I do think that I want to say that the Bills pulled out all the stops but they probably broke from some of their you know usual tendencies the last time that these two teams matched up. Uh all right. So the Chiefs, oh, you got something else? I do. I do have a little more on the offense if we're still sticking with the offense here. Yeah. I yeah. yeah. Um rewatching that week 5 game which again, I Largely, I'm taking the week five game and just throwing it out because these are two completely different teams. On both sides of the ball, they're two completely different teams. But one of the ways that they are ridiculously different is the way that this offensive line and Patrick Mahomes gelled. Orlando yeah. Brown Jr. had a ton of holding penalties called on him in this game, and it was because Patrick Mahomes was drifting out of the back of the pocket, something we were hammering hard on earlier this year just drifting out of the back of the pocket. And so you saw guys like Gregory Rousseau, AJ Epinesa, you know, these guys that were just attacking up the arc as hard as they could, knowing that Patrick Mahomes is going to be 12, 13, 14 yards deep. And Orlando Brown Jr. trying to keep up with them had to hold a little bit to protect Patrick Mahomes. So even though the Bills didn't blitz, they still got home plenty because of a lot of those types of rushes. Patrick Mahomes was uncomfortable. Orlando Brown Jr. was uncomfortable, and they got behind the sticks because of it. And there was some stuff that got wiped off the board because of it. We haven't seen that at the end of the year. So it has changed drastically as far as drops and how Patrick Mahomes has been able to be attacked. That was kind of the perfect storm. That's right when the Chiefs offensive line was kind of at its, you know, at its tendency, you could you could attack them that way, knowing that they were going to be that way because they hadn't made the transition quite all the way over to Patrick Mahomes and the offensive line, understanding where each other's strengths were yet. So I am interested to see if the Bills are going to try and still attack up the arc, if they're going to try and attack through these tackles a little bit, which is going to be beneficial to these tackles. And if Patrick Mahomes just ends up having a lot more time than we saw in that first matchup because of it. All right, Maddie, the Chiefs offense wins this game because why? So I think this matchup, I think especially without Tredavious White and everything we just kind of said and how the Bills are being forced into playing, I think the Chiefs offense matches up really well versus Bills defense. I don't think the Bills have the horses to cover Travis Kelsey, Tyree Kill, even McCole Hard and Byron. I don't think they have the guys to shut them down and man coverage for long plays. I don't know if when you have to be predictable with your zone coverages, if they have the bodies that they can get the pressure on Mahomes early enough. So I think the Chiefs offense is going to win by essentially attacking the right way. And what I mean by that is don't run a bunch of comebacks. Don't run all these little spacing concepts over the middle of the field where all of your receivers are just setting down in the middle of the field, right in the middle of the heart of this defense, right where the athletic linebackers, the good safeties are playing. If you go over the middle of the field, that's absolutely fine, but run through. I the, the Chiefs came out in that Steelers game and ran so many spacing concepts early, and all that was happening were these guys were jumping these in-breaking little curl routes, and it was making it really difficult to get things going. As soon as guys started crossing the field, as soon as they started working back to the outside a little bit, they found a lot of success. So attack this defense. Don't be afraid of them. Run crossers. Attack them deep. Just whatever you're doing, make the receiver stay on the move. Quit trying to play the timing game over the middle of the field versus this defense. I don't think that's where you win. I think you win by stressing them horizontally, stressing them vertically. Make that four-man pass rush, get home. Make that four-man pass rush, hurry you up. Don't hurry yourself up based on that. If you run what you run, if you do what you were doing well in the middle of that Pittsburgh game, I don't think this Buffalo Bills defense is designed to stop the Chiefs offense. For me, it's the screen game. Um, I think we watched that Pittsburgh Steelers game. We came away from it going, man, that screen game looked good. And when we got the all 22, man, it looked better. Holy crap. <laughs> those guys were moving and everything just was in tandem. It was moving well together. We talked about earlier this week, you know, trusting those guys to hit their spots, be as precise as possible and how we hadn't seen a ton of it. Guess what? They've been practicing it because it looked sharp against the Pittsburgh Steelers we're going to see it again against the Buffalo Bills. And it makes sense. If they're going to drop into quarter, quarter half, if they're going to try and protect these cornerbacks as much as possible, there are going to be advantageous angles to get out into space, 
get those offensive linemen out in front of you, eliminate defensive backs, linebackers at the second level, especially with a four-man pass rush that is going to be pinning their ears back and trying to get there, knowing they're not going to have blitz help coming or anything like that. That's when you can really find some success. You can take advantage of some aggression on the four-man front, and you can win and get some easy yardage through the screen game. I'm expecting a lot of Clyde Edwards-Alaire and Jet McKinnon in the screen game. And if it works even half as well as it did against the Pittsburgh Steelers, this offense is going to move the ball really, really well against this Buffalo Bills defense. Yeah, they're going to move the they're going to move the ball well, and the Chiefs' offense is going to win because they execute in the red zone. And I think that's going to be a crucial factor in this game here because I do think that you know I think they're going to have opportunities to drive down the field. Uh, I think they're you know they're going to get some you know some advantageous you know uh, options in between the twenties to play short, you know play the short game and drive down the field. The Bills have shown the you know the propensity to allow the Chiefs to do that in the past, but when they played in Buffalo, they presented very light boxes. The Chiefs ran all over them. I think you're going to have to execute well in the red zone. And the good news for the Chiefs is I think they did a pretty good job in the red zone. And I think their their play calling in the red zone last week was very good. You saw, you know, the sluggo. You saw them get a little bit more creative. They saw them break some tendency. It's not necessarily just as much about um it's not necessarily much about, you know, what they're gonna do this week, but the, what they've forced preparation wise in the red zone. They've given the Bills a lot to think about. They've shown Nick Allegretti able to catch even too. <laughs> you know, so there's there's I think I, I think the Chiefs are primed to do well in the red area. It's gonna be a big factor if they go out and when if they execute in the red zone, you know, after these long drives and finish these long drives with seven points, they're winning this football game. All right, now let's flip side of that. The Bills defense wins this matchup because why, Maddie? it's the opposite of what I just said. The Chiefs come out and they play a little bit timid on offense. They come out and they try to just win by the short game. They try to just win with their timing mm. passing attack. And I think there's going to be plenty of success to be had throwing the ball underneath. But I do think you're going to have to make the Bills respect the vertical game. You're going to have to make them respect passes over five yards before you can do that. If the Chiefs come out and just try to live with the short passing attack, this short, quick game, everything's off a three-step drop and on time, I think it's going to be a real struggle for the Chiefs to you know maintain consistency all the way through this game plan. I think that's going to play right into the Buffalo Bills game plan. They, their offense is high power. Their offense can score. They don't care if it's going to take you, you know, eight minutes to go down the field and maybe kick a field goal or maybe score a touchdown. They're going to challenge you to do that play in and play out if you're not going to make them respect the vertical passes and start picking up chunk plays. Yeah. Um, if they do what they did in week five and don't take care of the ball, like, I mean, that's. I, I hate to boil it down to that, but my goodness, that offense did not take care of the ball at all all in that game a couple with the penalties that i talked about with orlando brown jr it's shooting yourself in the foot we know this offense can move the ball we got to see it we've seen it a couple times throughout the end of the year here we've seen glimpses of it being just good really good and so i expect that you're going to see the a game script i expect that you're going to see mostly the a players put in the A positions. It's just execution and making sure that you take care of the ball on the way. That means you, Demarcus, tuck that thing. Don't be <laughs> carrying it like a loaf of bread. Patrick needs to make sure that he doesn't try and challenge some of this stuff that's a little bit more easily intercepted. Those guys are going to be lurking, robbing some of that middle of the field, especially the safeties that are you know kind of rotating deep late. There's lots of opportunities that the Bills are going to have to try and create turnovers, try and create havoc. We saw it in that first matchup, and it doomed them. It meant that they could not keep up with that Buffalo Bills offense. We've seen it at times this season. This is this is going to be one that they need absolutely every possession to go as well as it possibly can for the offense. So any sort of mistakes are going to just be amplified times a thousand. So they really got to make sure they take care of the ball. Yeah, that that's actually where I was wanting to go to. It's, I mean, it, it's, it's been the story of this team for, you know, the, I, I think, I think you can boil down this team and where they're at and why they, this is their second playoff game this year because of the turnover situation. Mm -hmm. I mean, and when things are going right, it's turnover or they're protecting the football when it's, when it's going wrong <laughs> and it went wrong for the beginning of the Steelers game. 
Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, the, the bad things have happened. Forcing a slow start, I think, is another thing. If the, if the Bills are able to force a slow start to this offense, that could be a little bit problematic as well for this team. Um, because, you know, yeah, they've responded. They responded well against the Steelers, but there's been plenty of games this year where they didn't respond as well, and they were just too far behind the eight ball. Patrick didn't start, you know, didn't throw with his chest the same way he was. He started pressing a little bit because there might not be, maybe there's some confidence, but there's only a certain line of confidence with some of his, you know, secondary weapons, not named Tyreek Hill and Travis Kelsey. All right, players to watch real quick on offense. Who we got, Maddie? I'm going to go with Patrick. Mo no, I'm kidding. I know that's going to be Ken's and he's got a rant set up for it. So I'm not going to steal that from him. What? Do I have a rant? Oh, you, should, you should so take it. Oh my goodness. I want to see. <laughs> Do I, have I just want to see the, the morale of the podcast. Just plummet. <laughs> I don't have a rant. Uh, you have a point. You have a, you have you have something you want to get out there, and that's why you put his name in there already. So I'm not going to do that. Um, I'm going to go with Travis Kelsey, and, and I hate to Weird. go with I hate to go with two big name, you know, star players for like the players to watch. We usually try not to do that for this, but for me, I think on this one, it's I want to see him continue the hundred yard streak, and I think it's a pretty good matchup to do so. Uh, I don't think I, I think of all guys, Travis Kelsey probably is the one of the most upset with how this last game went that he had a hard time getting going against the Bills. He took that huge shot from Poyer late in the game, which messed up, you know, the next few games of the season. I think that Travis Kelsey is going to come out and try to, you know, extend that hundred yard streak, have a big game. I think he could be from what I've seen from this Bills, whether they try to cover him with Siren Neal, like they've done in the past, or these linebackers, if he's getting one on ones, which I think this Bills defense is going to give him, he should have a huge game. We're going with three superstars, by the way. Oh, Matt, nice. Matt is trying to slight my man. My guy is Creed Humphrey. Uh, Creed is coming off, I I think, from my perspective, one of his worst games of the season, uh, which is not anything to be ashamed of. Cameron Hayward is a monster on the interior. Like, it, nothing wrong with that. He needs a rebound game against Ed Oliver, and I think he can. Like, he's seen Ed Oliver once before now. He's seen what he can do. He's really come into his own as a player. I think everybody appreciates everything that Creed does for this offense. It's time for a big monster game from Creed Humphrey in a matchup that with this four-man rush, he has to win. Because if that interior is clean, Patrick Mahomes is going to have all the time in the world. He's going to be able to move through the pocket in the ways that we've seen him do recently and that have made such positive impacts on this offense. Creed Humphrey is a massive part of that. So I'm looking for him and the rest of the interior offensive line, but mostly him to have a monster game, beat up on Ed Oliver, get your mojo back, go into the AFC championship with some swagger. It's LeVon Mahomes for me. I love what Bobby Stroop said last week. Patrick left the first quarter and you're dealing with, with LeVon now. That was some of the most fun football we've seen from LeVon all year. And when LeVon comes out in full force and, and throws with his chest, as Maddie says, and plays with the kind of confidence and freedom and swagger that we see, there is nobody better than him. As not even the guy lined up across from him this week. So I am going with LaVon Mahomes. I want to see it. I want to see it for 60. I am. We'll get to it here in a little bit. <laughs> Defense. What is. All right. So like we're going to talk about the defensive side of the ball. What's the Bills offense, Maddie? Or, or, yeah. Or Craig. What is what is the Bills offense? I mean, if you ask most Chiefs fans, it's terrifying. Like, I think <laughs> I think that's that's what everybody's saying right now. They're all sitting back there and being like, "Man, I am scared of what Buffalo can do. I'm as scared of what Buffalo can do as I am about the fact that I don't have a good liquor store to go to in Kansas City right now." And you know what? That's all about to be resolved for you with Macadoodles coming to Lee's Summit in summer of 2022. You guys. It's coming. It's going to be awesome. You've been hearing me talk about this for almost a damn year now about how awesome Macadoodles is. And I mean it every single time that I talk about it. Customer service, pricing, selection is all elite. And it's coming to you in Kansas City. The only problem is there's only one of them 
And so we need more of them so that everybody in Kansas City can experience the joy of McAdoodle. So if you are a franchisee, do not be scared of what the liquor market in Kansas City looks like right now. Get a hold of Roger, info at mcadoodles.com. Put the frightened feelings away and become a franchisee of McAdoodles all over Kansas City. So that way everybody in Kansas City can be happy with their liquor situation. All right, on to the bills. So here we go. This is a really good offense. <laughs> they, they are really, really, really good. Um, Josh Allen is terrifying because Josh Allen has the, you know, has the arm capability to make every throw on the field. Dan Sorensen will tell you that firsthand knowledge. Every throw on the field, he'll be able to get vertical on you. He can make all that stuff, flats, all those touch throws. He can hit those windows. He is just ridiculously difficult to defend as a passer, and he might be an even better runner. He's just a monster. He's a freight train out in space, and he's really hard to bring down even when you do have a clear hit on him. And it's not like he's clunky when he's running. He's able to shake guys in space as well, defensive backs. It's just a very difficult offense to go up against and try and try and game plan for because they do everything so well. That being said, there are some weaknesses on this offensive line. It's not the best offensive line that the Chiefs defense has seen this season. Um, there are some weaknesses at running back. Uh, Devin Singletary is a fine running back. He's not necessarily an elite running back like the Chiefs have seen, although Isaiah McKenzie is trying to make a case over there. Like uh, I'll let Matty talk about him in a second. They're, the wide receivers are terrific. Dawson Knox is a really good tight end. There's just a lot of complementary pieces to this offense, and the way that they like to attack starting at the start of the game, they like to try and go deep early. They have some of these deeper passing concepts, they have some deeper drops, and they try and hit you deep. They want to beat you quick, and they want to beat you early. We've seen that them do that to a bunch of teams this year. They get up early, then all of a sudden, they can run a little bit more. They can kind of create a little bit more in their quarterback run game, and they get into the rhythm a little bit better. But what we've seen is some teams have started blitzing them early and then backing off late, and that's giving them some fits so i am looking to see if they continue to try and do some of those deeper concepts try and hit that stuff over the top on the chiefs get up on them big like they did in that first matchup and try and relax and kind of sit back a little bit on the run game after that if the chiefs can stop that early and stop that onslaught early you might get them more into a panic mode as we've seen with some other teams this year and that's when josh allen starts to make mistakes so for me, the Bills offense, it, they, they're really good at putting a team in a bind, right? So when they're passing the ball, if you want to play man coverage, if you just want to lock up the receivers in man coverage, say you have the guys to cover Stefan Diggs and everybody else, you're going to play man coverage. Josh Allen can just run. Josh Allen can literally just take off and run anytime you want to. And he's arguably their best. Run. He's arguably the best running back in this game between either team. Like he's that good of a runner. So you can't just play man coverage without fear of that. If you're just going to sit back and play zone, if you don't get pressure with the guys you're bringing, Josh Allen's to the point now where he's got the arm talent and he understands things enough that he can make a throw anywhere on the field and eventually one of these receivers is going to be open. So you can't just sit there and play in this zone coverage and try to take everything away before he you know throws this pass out and completes it. So in the passing game, you're putting a bind there. In the running game, they've transitioned to a lot of this gap stuff, but it's getting outside the tackle box, especially whether it's jet sweeps with Isaiah McKenzie, whether it's actually running power with Devin Singletary. They run a lot of outside zone, especially to the strong side. So they'll run wide zone outside of two tight ends. But what they'll also do if a defense overplays it, they'll run QB power to the weak side. So now all of a sudden you can't overload the strong side or you can't you know align yourself to defend the strong side outside zone. And you can't align yourself to defend the weak side to stop the QB power because they can run this gap stuff either direction. So they're really good at putting defenses in a bind, making you kind of have to pick your poison. I will say this. 
Craig talked about summer shortcomings. I think one of their bigger shortcomings this year is the inability to operate consistently in the quick game. I don't think they're a quick game offense. Cole Beasley hasn't been near as good this year as he's been in years past, especially down the stretch. I know he's missed some time with COVID at one point in time and stuff like that, but his only two good games kind of down the stretch were against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and Carolina Panthers. They weren't even great games. Those were the only two games where he was really a, a factor. And I'll tell you what, the reason he was a factor in those two games was because they couldn't do what they wanted to do on offense. I'm going to get more into that here when we talk about how the Chiefs mm-hmm. defense can win. But there's a very specific reason that Cole Beasley was more involved in those two games. So like their quick game isn't great. If you can force them to be a quick game passing attack, I think that's where it is. I think that's the way you can attack this offense. But man, they are so good at putting defenses in a bind. They, it's hard to do it consistently. It's hard to force them to play with their left hand as much as possible because they're just so good. Well, because second reaction plays are a piece of this offense too that are really, it, it's it's kind of worrisome because I think some of their secondary players, the Gabriel Davises, the Dawson Knox, have shown some propensity to, to win out of structure. And Josh Allen's done a good job of finding some of these guys out of structure on some of these explosive plays. So there are additional elements that I mean, you can do things right and still be wrong when it's all said and done and give up an explosive play. So you've got to be extremely mindful of that because we've seen, you know, some of these, you know, the, the, he, Josh Allen's, you know, he's, he's gotten other guys involved maybe that, you know, aren't, you know, not the star, you know, it, it's, you know, not that Stefan Diggs doesn't get plays in structure, but I think he's looking Stefan's way a lot of times in structure. And if he has to stretch it, Gabriel Davis has shown a propensity to make some plays. Uh, same with Dawson Knox. So like that's another little element. And they've ran the ball a little bit decently. Like they had some success running the football, not with just just Josh Allen on some design QB runs. It's not just him, you know, scrambling out. Like they've they've run some design, you know, QB runs. You know, Devin Singletary had a good week last week too. So a lot of challenges that this group presents. Uh, but why does the Chiefs defense win, Maddie? Or Craig? I'm sorry, Craig. My bad. I'm just. I mean, it, but Maddie can take it. I, I mean, I'm more than happy to defer to the man who knows the most. All right, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with uh, them blitzing on early downs. We talked about. All right, talked about how Josh Allen and this offense want to go down the field early. They want to hit that on early downs. They also run really well on early downs as well. Steve Spagnuolo has not hesitated to bring run blitzes on early downs, especially with Nick Bolton and Willie Gay in the backfield there. So I want them to bring those run blitzes that can then transition into some pass blitzes. We've seen this offense get a little bit rattled by the blitz. Now, Josh Allen is perfectly capable of escaping the blitz and breaking it for a big game. So you've got to make sure that you keep your rush pass, that everybody's on the same page, and you corral him as much as possible. But he doesn't want to get rid of it quick. He doesn't always have a hot read that's you know within five yards. Sometimes his hot, because he can get the ball out so fast, is 15 or you know 12 or 15 yards down the field. So it's a little bit later breaking, and this offense has gotten away with that a lot of times. If you can get on top of him quick, you will rattle him, you will create more third and longs, and when you get into those third and longs, do not blitz. <laughs> That's when you don't want to blitz against this team. You actually want to try and result in more of a three-man rush, maybe a spy on Josh Allen a little bit, try and keep him in the pocket a little bit more because he's going to try and go for all of it. He's going to try and throw past the sticks. I am all for flood and coverage at that point in those obvious situations and try and confuse him a little bit because I do think that this defensive line with Frank Clark, Chris Jones, Melvin Ingram is good enough to win with three. It has been good enough in the past few games to win with three. So if you've got Willie Gay Jr. on the field, it's kind of that by mugged up linebacker and he's able to mirror Josh Allen keep him in the pocket, keep him from breaking some of these longer runs. Now, all of a sudden, you can force him to be more of a pocket passer against a you know a flooded secondary. That's something that I want. That's something that Spagnuolo probably wants as well. I think that that's the best, best path for success based on how I've seen other defenses really take advantage of this Bills offense so far this season. Yeah, and I'm just going to piggyback off of essentially what Craig's talking about here because I think it's pre- the answer is clearly 
pressuring Josh Allen. When Josh Allen gets pressured, he does freeze a little bit. He panics a little bit. He's not completely calm and cool under pressure. And most quarterbacks aren't. I mean, even Patrick Mahomes is, especially this year, has been worse under pressure than when he's not pressured. But the thing with Josh Allen is I do think it affects him a little bit more. So like when I was watching through some games, there's only three teams that blitz the Buffalo Bills over 40% of the snaps. It was the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, the Carolina Panthers, and the Miami Dolphins in the second game. Now, Josh Allen was great versus the Dolphins. He lit them mm-hmm. up, but that was early in the year when their offense was still kind of clicking. Down the stretch, the Buccaneers and the Panthers, I mean, they forced him to lower his yards per attempt. He threw two touchdowns and interception, got sacked four times, and his completion percentage was under 60% when he was thus just being blitzed, not even just under pressure. So when you can pressure him, especially when you can blitz him a lot, if you blitz Josh Allen a lot and you start making him think about who's coming, he does hesitate a little bit. He'll force the ball out a little too early and dig, dig bury it in the dirt. He'll try to extend the play. Like he's not the calmest guy under pressure. So I think with the Chiefs, it starts with blitzing. You got to start early. Craig said it blitzing on early downs. He mentioned it earlier. Teams came out and blitzed the Buffalo Bills early on. I think you do that. I think you crowd the line of scrimmage. You bring a lot of different pressures from different areas. You catch this offensive line, which has not been very good at sorting out pass protection at all. It, the, the Bills make it pretty easy. They'll put a running back as like a sniffer behind the guard. You can very easily keep him in to their protection call. He's not getting out as a hot read or anything like that. You can dictate their pass protection. The Chiefs broke the Dallas Cowboys pass protection. The Chiefs no, literally broke, broke the Dallas Cowboys for all year. You saw the 49ers do the exact same stuff the Chiefs were doing the entire playoff game. The Chiefs, Steve Spagnuolo broke the Dallas Cowboys offensive line. There's no reason he can't do the same to this Bills offensive line. Once you establish that you can control their protection calls, that you can get pressure when blitzing and make Josh Allen, you'll panic a little bit. Now, all of a sudden, you can start dropping out. Now you show pressure, but drop out. You make Allen think he's going fast. Even when he realizes he doesn't have to, he stills a little bit, plays less good. He's not as good in that scenario. We saw that last year when the Chiefs and the Bills played. On top of that, I think there's going to be plenty of opportunities if you're controlling, if you're dictating this pass protection, the Chiefs four-man pass rush will absolutely have success versus this Bills offensive line. If you can force them to slide away from Chris Jones and give him one-on-one with either of these guards or Mitch Morse, and that's a huge advantage to Chris Jones. If you can get Melvin Ingram aligned one-on-one with Spencer Brown with nobody available mm-hmm. to help, that's a bloodbath. Like There's so many one-on-one options in this game that the Chiefs should win. So it's all about that early pressure and making Josh Allen feel it. You can't just blitz and not make him feel it. If he's if it's not working, stop. Just quit. Bail on it because it's not worth getting guys out of coverage to just keep blitzing. But you have to try it early on to make him second guess what they're trying to do. And early pressure. Uh, speaking of that, like, look, I I don't want to get too like narrative driven here, but like also like like this isn't an X and O's thing, but there's an emotional element to this, and it's very obvious on both sides of the football, but specifically with the Buffalo Bills. The Bills felt like they exercised the demons of their playoff loss earlier in the year. But Josh Allen largely wasn't ready for that moment last time. These two teams played when the game mattered uh, in the playoffs. And the emotions that he's going to have to handle and the pressure he's going to feel both on the field and trying to keep up with Mahomes if the offense gets off to a hot start, that is something to take into consideration here too. Because I do think Josh Allen is a more emotional quarterback when it comes to having a hard time handling it. Which is probably, you know, we, there's some of the stuff t- talking about. I know quarterback rating is not the most fun, you know, like not the most reliable statistic, but the volatility that he showed as a quarterback. I think this team plays with a lot of emotion. And I think Josh Allen is an emotional roller coaster in some way, shape, or form. So if you're able to get pressure, if you're able to get some stuff home, if the offense on the other side of this, on the other side of the field is playing to its level, I think that there is. Um, there, there, there's very much a, 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 sin, a scenario where Josh Allen speeds himself up a little bit too, and the Chiefs can definitely play a factor with all the things that you guys just mentioned. I think it, I, but I think it nails it on the head. I think it all starts with how much you can affect Joshua Allen, and I think a lot of things can just a matter of what the mix is. Uh, how does this Bills offense win, though, Craig? Oh man, well, you struggle to tackle Josh Allen. You tackle yeah. like the Chiefs have at times this season. I mean. It, Let's be honest. Uh, the Chiefs' tackling effort at times this season has been poor, and it's really come back to bite them in the ass. Against the Cincinnati Bengals, that's a game that the Chiefs win if they make one of seven tackles behind the line of scrimmage that they missed. 
There are multiple other games this season that we have seen this Chiefs defense struggle to bring guys down, not just in space, but also in a phone booth. They really have not been a great tackling team, which is why earlier this week we talked about how well that they tackled against the Pittsburgh Steelers and how that's something, that intensity, that aggression, and how they handled all of that is good going forward. If they do not bring down Josh Allen when they have these open blitzes, when they have these opportunities on these quarterback runs, when he gets out into space, if they do not bring him down, it's going to kill them because Josh Allen will get into empty on a third and four and he'll run up the gut and he'll tell the linebackers basically, hey, come get me. I'm I'm a freight train. You know, I'm coming right down the A gap. You've got to step in here. You've got to make this tackle. And teams so far this year have not been able to because he's he's a monster. But also, if the Chiefs are able to do that, if they're able to get ahead of the sticks, they will force Josh Allen to press. Kent talked about it. He does get into those situations. When things are going poorly, he tries to get it all back all at once. He wants to get back in the game immediately. He hates being behind. He's a competitor. When you saw against the Colts, he made repeated mistakes as they got further and further down. So if you can frustrate him, if you can get him into those scenarios, then you are going to have him making mistakes. Conversely, if you're allowing him to run through you, jump over you in Legereus Sneed's case in that game in week five, or just generally running through tackles, he's going to gain confidence, he's going to play better, and that offense is going to be very difficult to stop. For me, I talked about how Cole Beasley hasn't been that effective this year, except for specific situations. I talked about how I don't think the Bills have a great quick game. Well, to counter that, if the Chiefs do what I anticipate them doing, which is trying to force everything short, playing a lot of deep coverage, forcing things underneath, someone's going to have to come up and make a play. I think the guy for the Bills that could really tilt the game, if this is the case, is Isaiah McKenzie. Wide receiver, halfback, whatever, however they're going to line him up all over the field. And McKenzie's going to present a lot of problems for the Chiefs. We talk a lot about how the Chiefs don't have a ton of athletes on the second level and these guys that can really hold contain. I Even Willie Gay, as athletic as he is, he can't stop, I don't think, Isaiah McKenzie on some of these jet sweeps. The way that the Bills get into some of these things where they not only will get him on a jet sweep, but they'll somehow find a way to get a arcing tight end blocker out in front of him. They'll find a way to pull a guard to get out in front of him. They get him out in space so well from the backfield, but then lately he's become a decent receiver. They're running him on a lot of shallow crossing routes, but all of a sudden, these two weeks ago, they ran him on a couple deep crossing routes and they connected on one. Last week, they ran a cross, but then a fake cross, but then returned back to the outside, and they got him wide open on that. They're doing a really good job of getting Isaiah McKenzie open and manufacturing touches and yards for him. He is their version of McCole Hardman right now. That's how they use him, but the way that they get into using him right now has been a little bit more effective than what I think the Chiefs have been able to work up this year because they have so many other things working with the QB run game. With all of their power runs, they marry those things together so well. You'll get a fly sweep fake. To Isaiah McKenzie, but off of it, uh, Josh Allen will be reading the defense and he'll either keep it and run QB power to the right, or McKenzie's taking a fly sweep with some pullers out to the left. You have to pick or choose. I think that's going to be really difficult for the Chiefs to so not, not only decipher that, but then to also corral McKenzie on these manufactured touches. I think it's going to be difficult if he gets going. If he has a big game, that could be a big problem for the Chiefs because now all of a sudden the Bills have found a way to produce the short game. They found a way to get their quick passing game in or a substitute for it. Now the whole field is open again because the Chiefs have to react. They have to dedicate more to stop Isaiah McKenzie. I think real quick, I think if the Bills hit some of their second reaction plays, Josh Allen's able to extend and it's either his legs or it's him being able to find some of these guys I talked about earlier down the field. That could really swing this game too. And I think that Bills are going to need a couple of those kinds of plays, second reaction down the field to a guy like a Gabriel Davis, a guy like Dawson Knox. Players to watch. Uh, what do we got, Craig? I'm going with Willie Gay Jr., I know everybody hung on the fact that he only played 25% of the snaps against the Pittsburgh Steelers. That was more of a game script thing. Uh, Willie Gay plays in almost all of the base and nickel snaps for this team. He does not get a green dot. That's why he doesn't get on the field in the dime because the coaching staff cannot communicate with him. The green dots go to Anthony Hitchens, Ben Neiman, and Nick Bolton. 
you take that up with the coaching staff and all that. But that's why he's not playing in the dime. But I don't expect that we're going to be seeing a ton of dime in this game. I think it's going to be close. I think there's going to be a lot of you know, chunk-ish plays. And I don't think that you're going to get into too terribly many third and long. So I think you're going to see Willie Gay Jr. play a lot in this game. And he's going to be needed because he's the one guy on the second level there, along with Legereus Need, that can keep up with some of the stuff that the Buffalo Bills are going to try and do as a reactionary player, not as a, I read that, I knew where that was going, I'm going to beat that with the angle. He's a guy that can maybe initially get fooled and still get to the spot because he is that kind of athlete. If he can make some of those plays, it's going to go a long way to staying ahead of the sticks. Conversely, he has been very good at getting in, throwing lanes as a slant defender. When we see the Buffalo Bills sort of transition away from some of those early deep throws, they go to some more of those deeper slant options, try and get to the middle of the field, try and stress those linebackers. Willie Gay Jr. just has kind of an innate feel for those specific types of routes. So I can see him undercutting them, taking some of those away, not necessarily, you know, picking anything off that Josh Allen is going to throw, but maybe making him double clutch enough to where the four-man rush can get home. So I think Willie Gay Jr. can play a big role that may not be as noticeable in this game as it may seem initially, but a big role nonetheless. I'm going to go with the Chiefs' best defensive playoff performer over the last couple of years. That's right. Frank the Shark Clark is the guy that we're calling upon in this game. His matchups with Deion Dawkins have been up and down throughout their matchups with the Bills. Or last regular season, he was really good against them. In the playoffs, it was a little more even. Back from injury in Week 5, he was largely a non-factor in there, but there were still some nice reps. However, so that matchup is fine. You get Frank Clark working off the right side, working against rookie Spencer Brown, you're going to have a lot of trouble. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's Ingram or Clark. I just would get Clark over there as much as possible because Spencer Brown has been adequate for a rookie this year, but boy, some teams have given him some trouble. The Buccaneers, when Spencer Brown was playing left tackle, were beating him routinely. Brian Burns for the Panthers was putting Spencer Brown through the chip, wood chipper. Like He could not stay in front of him at all. I think Frank Clark could have a dominant performance or whoever's lined up on that side. I would just lean on Frank Clark. I think his savvy, he's a little bit more athletic than Melvin Ingram right now. Get him lined up over there. We know Chris Jones is going to be dominant on the interior. You know Melvin Ingram is going to make an impact some point in time in this game. But give me that Frank Clark-Spencer Brown matchup. I really do think that Clark could not only continue to climb up the rankings for playoff sacks of all time, but he could be a huge reason the Chiefs win this game because I do think that particular side of the tackle spot, that Spencer Brown playing right tackle spot, is a big weakness along this Bills team. I'm sorry I'm being easy here, and you just talked about him a little bit. I'm going to go with Chris Jones, and I don't care. Um, I think quick interior pressure could be really massive for this team, and obviously the person uh, with the closest path to sacking or affecting Josh Allen is Chris Jones. And I think he's got to have one of his best games of the year. Uh, and if he does, I think that goes a long way in this Chiefs team winning. Because if they're able to generate quick interior pressure, it can make you know the it can make the jobs of the edges a little bit easier with their contain. Uh, it can make things a little bit better trying to control and contain Josh Allen, period. Uh, and obviously, you just just hitting them and affecting them. I think you know Chris Jones is gonna his his impact along the interior is gonna go a long way in determining this game. And if we get a dud, if we get a silent game from him, I think we're probably talking about a Chiefs loss. Speaking of whether or not the Chiefs are losing, it's prediction time, boys. Uh, Craig, what do we have here? Do you guys know the most points that the Buffalo Bills defense has given up this year? Because I do. It's not many. <laughs> it's, uh, I believe, it's 34 to the Tennessee Titans. Never mind. It's 41 to the Indianapolis, Indianapolis Colts. It's a tough task to score on this defense. Most of the opponents that they come up against get down to this offense, and this offense can bleed the clock. It is imperative that this Kansas City Chiefs offense start well. If they start like they did against the Pittsburgh Steelers, they will find themselves in a hole. I truly believe that Brian Dable and the Buffalo Bills offense are going to be able to put some points on the board early. I think this Magnolia is going to come out with a good game plan, but we're going to see 
maybe some tendency breakers, maybe the Buffalo Bills able to put some points on the board, maybe a little bit of a difference maker in Josh Allen extending some plays and scoring some points. So I do think the Bills will go up early, but I think that Patrick LaVon Mahomes, sorry, just LaVon Mahomes is capable of bringing this team back. We talk about Josh Allen feeling the pressure, pressing, maybe making mistakes. We haven't seen that out of Patrick Mahomes. If anything, we've seen him elevate his game in that scenario, throwing the ball sideways in a Super Bowl behind a traffic cone offensive line. Like We've seen all of that. He brings this team back. Steve Spagnuolo makes the necessary adjustments. That defensive line gets home, and the Chiefs, on a last-second field goal, end up winning this game 38-35. I want to take a second to pour one out for Kent dying on the inside of this podcast went over an hour. So we're going to start there. <laughs> second, we are going to go. Uh, when we started this podcast, I wasn't sure what I wanted the final score to be. I thought that playoffs defenses are going to step up. They're going to make some stops. They're going to do some stuff to kind of slow down these off. It's not a low scoring game, but I thought it might not be as high scoring as everybody thought. As we talk through this, though, I really don't like the avenues for either defense to really shut down the other offense. This is going to be, I think it's going to be so hard for either one of these defenses to stop the opposing offense, especially if the opposing offenses are playing well. I think given the magnitude of this game, given what we've seen from Josh Allen, what we've seen from Patrick Mahomes, what we've seen from the Chiefs, from the Bills, I think they're going to come out. And I don't know if you're going to get an A plus game out of both sides on the offensive side of the ball, but you're going to get an A game. You're going to get a good game from both. When that's happening, I don't trust either defense to stop one another consistently. So I'm going to take the Chiefs 44 to 40. High scoring game, a lot of points on the board. Get all your fireworks, get all your sweet potatoes out there, whatever you need. Have everything ready because there's going to be a lot of points scored. I just trust Steve Spagnuolo a little bit more to dial up enough plays, to dial up enough crazy stuff to get that one or two extra stops needed to get the ball back to his offense so the Chiefs go and hold on 44 to 40. Boy, that's some Goots offense right there. <laughs> there it is. I was waiting for it the whole day. Uh, yeah, it's been interesting to kind of observe uh, Bills fans versus Chiefs fans this year. Uh, and Bills fans versus Chiefs fan this week too, because the Chiefs have achieved what the Bills are looking at. The they, the Chiefs have have have, a, have have won a Super Bowl. They've had a ton of success. They have you know they have broken through and won a Lamar Hunt Trophy. They've won a pair of them now, and there is a different kind of hunger from that fan base. There's a different kind of you know hunger from Buffalo from the Northeast, and they're kind of looking up at us. And there's there's a confidence there to them and a swagger that you kind of see permeating, you know, on social media. And it's fascinating. I haven't really seen that kind of energy or vibe from the team, from the Chiefs. And it, I think that should scare the Buffalo Bills. Because I think that there is this just calm laser focus happening right now in arrowhead where like look we are we have the best player in the world he doesn't he's not in buffalo he's not anywhere he's not in green bay he's in kansas city and that guy has done more for this city and he has done more for us as fans than anybody in the history of our life he's our michael jordan and i think we forget that sometimes we forget it a lot because what we have seen and what we have been a part of historically in the last four years is unbelievable. We are beyond lucky. But I just remember in 2018, watching Patrick Mahomes and watching this team and, and just thinking, there's just, there's just no way it can get better. And then it would. And then like he just continued to break ceilings and he continued to just exceed expectations. And blow our mind to a point where our brains are broken. Our calibration on greatness is broken. Like, you know, like the quote from the office, you, you don't know you're in the good times until you're out of them. Right? Well, I think Patrick Mahomes, like we're due for Patrick Mahomes surprising us. Because I think that there is a little brother nagging at his shoulder right now. I think there is a team that legitimately can challenge the Chiefs. 
And I think this is a pretty defining moment here for this organization and for this rivalry. And I think Patrick Mahomes is going to stomp him. I think this is a moment where the Buffalo Bills are defined as little brother. Yeah, they're a good challenge. And maybe they're going to get them once or twice in the next decade. But the decade is largely going to revolve around Kansas City, Arrowhead. And it starts on Sunday. 38-31, Chiefs advance to the AFC Championship game and continue their pursuit of their Super Bowl. That's going to do it for the KC Laboratory. We love you. We appreciate you. We will talk to you after a Chiefs victory on Sunday.